Castle Wolfenstein. This folder contains the location of Death's Head's compound. It could be our last chance, this, before the Nazis wipe out all that's good in the world. The impact that Wolfenstein has had on the industry cannot be overstated. Though it originally started out as a top-down stealth franchise, once it was picked up by id Software, thanks to a fortunate lapsing of trademarks, it went on to become, essentially, the father of the first-person shooter genre, one of the most popular and enduring genres in the history of the industry. Like any other franchise, though, Wolfenstein has seen its fair share of ups and downs. For many a year, it's faded away into obscurity and irrelevance, with its name being remembered in the pages of history books and really nowhere else. In 2014, with the blessing of id Software, a Swedish studio took on the daunting task of reinventing this great franchise and doing so in a way that it wouldn't lose its identity, but also become relevant in the contemporary gaming scene once again. And possibly enough, they did it, and since that day, Wolfenstein has only gone from strength to strength. Machine Games, with support from Arcane Studios, are now gearing up for the release of their fourth Wolfenstein game, or their third depending on how you look at The Old Blood. And with days left until its launch, now feels like the right time to look back at the narrative that they've spun with all their efforts so far. Because when Machine Games were handed the reins of the series, they made the story and the storytelling a primary focus, and managed to do a damn fine job of it. So without further ado, let's go over everything you need to know about Wolfenstein's story before you play Youngblood. Though 2014's Wolfenstein The New Order was technically a reboot of the series, it didn't completely wipe the slate clean. In spite of being a fresh start for Wolfenstein, it was still a proper successor to 2009's Raven Software-developed Wolfenstein, in that it followed on from that game's narrative, which itself had been a sequel to Return to Castle Wolfenstein, which, funnily enough, was also a franchise reboot. So before we begin talking about the Machine Games Wolfenstein saga, let's briefly go over the two aforementioned games and the events that they portrayed. The narrative threads that the New Order shares with them are few and far between, so we won't be going over them in too much detail. But there are still a couple of characters that appear in those two games who have important roles in the New Order. Return to Castle Wolfenstein takes place in the year 1943 and sees U.S. Army Ranger William B.J. Blazkowicz being sent into Egypt to investigate increasing activities of the Nazi SS Paranormal Division. The story of the game has a lot of occult and supernatural trappings, most of which ultimately have very little bearings on what we need to be concerned with now. But one important character serves an important role here, the head of the SS Special Projects Division, Wilhelm Death's Head Strasse. And that essentially is all you really need to know about Return to Castle Wolfenstein, so let's jump straight ahead to its sequel, the 2009 shooter developed by Raven Software, called simply Wolfenstein. Death's Head returns once again as the primary antagonist in Wolfenstein, and this time to foil his plans in the village of Eisenstadt, BJ enlists the help of the German resistance group called the Kreisau Circle, led by former school teacher Caroline Becker. Though Caroline gets grievously injured while helping BJ, BJ is able to put a stop to Death's Head's plans. Death's Head, however, still manages to escape. This is where we officially move into the Machine Games era of Wolfenstein, but before we begin speaking about the New Order, we need to briefly look at The Old Blood, the standalone prequel that leads directly into the events of Machine Games' first Wolfenstein title. The Old Blood sees BJ embarking on a mission to find the location of Death's Head and his compound which he manages to do in the end. And as he heads out on the mission to assassinate the Nazi leader, he hopes that after this, which he is hoping will be his final mission, he'll finally be able to rest. But of course that doesn't happen, because now we move into the New Order, which begins at the dawn of July 16, 1946. By the time the New Order begins, the tides of the Second World War have turned drastically in the Nazis' favor. They've acquired unknown technologies of equally unknown origins that have allowed them to create weapons with which they've continuously overpowered the Allied forces. With the war on the brink of being lost, the Allies are throwing everything they have at a massive raid on the hideout of Death's Head, which also happens to be his weapons laboratory, from where all these dangerous weapons are coming. In this raid, of course, BJ leads the charge, alongside Scottish pilot Fergus Reed and the inexperienced private Probst Wyatt. The three of them manage to infiltrate Death's Head's compound, but things quickly go wrong. They're cornered by a group of Death's Head's super soldiers, led by Death's Head himself, and overpowered and outnumbered as they are, BJ is forced by the Nazi leader to make a tough and brutal choice, to choose whoever it is between Fergus and Wyatt that Death's Head ends up killing. After players, as BJ, make the choice, the survivor and BJ are left locked in a room, while Death's Head turns on the room's incinerators to kill both of them anyway. Working together, the two of them manage to find a way out of the room, but just as they're escaping, the room inside explodes. The explosion sends debris flying everywhere, a piece of which strikes BJ in the back of his head, making him lose consciousness as he plummets into the sea below. 
but his injuries proved to be much more than a momentary loss of consciousness. Thanks to his injury, BJ is paralyzed and falls into a vegetative state. He's taken to a mental asylum in Poland, and that is where he remains for 14 years. For those 14 years, he becomes nothing but an observer of everything that's going on around him, unable to move and speak, imprisoned in his own body. His care falls into the hands of a nurse named Anya Olewa, who along with her parents runs the asylum. Throughout the years, BJ is forced to witness as Nazi officials come into the asylum and forcibly take patients away for execution, deeming them subhuman because of their disabilities. It's now 1960. 14 years on from the raid on Death's Head's compound and since the day BJ was injured. On the fateful day, the story picks up again, orders come in from Nazi command that the asylum is to be shut down. In the ensuing struggle, all the patients are massacred and Anya's parents are killed. And just as BJ himself is about to be executed as well, he manages to wake from his vegetative state. From there, he cuts through the Nazi extermination squad and with Anya in tow, escapes from the asylum. Together, the two of them head to a farm owned by Anya's grandparents. With a welcome and brief reprieve from all that's been going on, BJ is finally able to catch up on the state of the war. As it turns out, there isn't a war anymore. The Second World War is over. It was won by the Nazis in 1948 when they forced the United States to surrender by using nuclear bombs on a few American cities, while also being aided by their new technological breakthroughs. Following that, all leading members of the resistance were either killed or captured. In the years since then, the Reich has spread and established its control over the entire world and rules it firmly with a cold iron grip. Of course, BJ isn't going to lie down and take that. While escaping the asylum, he and Anya had managed to take one of the Nazis from the extermination squad captive, and after learning about the outcome of the war from Anya's grandparents, he goes on to interrogate him, and quite brutally at that. From him, BJ learns that all the resistance members and leaders have been held captive in Berlin. As soon as BJ gets the intel, he executes his Nazi prisoner anyway. Anya's grandparents agree to smuggle her and BJ through a checkpoint in Stettin, from where the two of them will board a train traveling to Berlin. But the train ride proves to be quite eventful as well. On the train, BJ also runs into someone very interesting, in the most repulsive, horrifying way possible. Frau Irene Engel, a high-ranking Nazi official and forced labor camp commandant. BJ has a tense encounter with Engel and Hans Bubi Winkel, her right-hand man, but somehow manages to keep his cover intact. Upon their arrival in Berlin, Anya helps BJ break into the prison, where he finds and rescues either Fergus or Wyatt, whichever one he had helped to survive 14 years earlier in Death's Head's compound. The survivor tells BJ that the resistance against the established Reich is a revived Kreisau circle, led by none other than Caroline Becker herself, who became paralyzed after her injuries in Eisenstadt during the events of Wolfenstein 2009. BJ, Anya, and the survivor head to the headquarters of the Kreisau circle and join up with the resistance once again. Inspired by BJ's return, the resistance begins its activities in earnest once again, and their first course of action takes the form of an attack on a Nazi research facility in London, which, like the rest of the world by now, is also firmly under the Reich's control. BJ and the resistance blow up the facility's base of operations and manage to acquire sensitive documents that reveal some vital information. It shows that the Nazis have been using a unique, heavily improved form of concrete called super concrete that's allowed them to erect cities in a matter of weeks. Interestingly enough though, they also detect that the super concrete has been sabotaged and that due to tampering, it's been growing mold that causes these buildings to eventually crumble. Figuring that the saboteur is someone who'd be willing to help them in their efforts against the Reich, the resistance is able to decipher their identity. A man named Set Roth, who, as luck, or a lack thereof would have it, is being held captive in a forced labor camp run by Irene Engel. BJ infiltrates the labor camp where he's able to get in touch with Set, who tells him some interesting stuff. Set, as it turns out, is a member of the secret order of Jewish scientists called the Dat Yishud. With unique and powerful technology at their disposal, thanks to which throughout the years they've been able to create things such as artificial intelligence, energy weapons, and more, including the super concrete being used by the Nazis. It is this very technology that the Nazis stole that allowed them to suddenly turn the tide of the war and ultimately win it. Set agrees to help BJ and take him to one of the society's secret vaults if he helps him destroy the labor camp they're in. Together, they successfully commandeer the largest robot in the camp and rip it to pieces, in the process killing multiple Nazis, disfiguring Irene Engel and allowing the camp's prisoners to escape. Afterward, Set tells them that he knows of the location of a cache of Dot Yishud technology in one of the society's secret vaults, but there's a catch. To access the vault, they're going to need a Nazi U-boat, because the vault happens to be deep beneath the ocean. And so the Resistance tracks down and successfully manages to infiltrate and hijack a Nazi U-boat. The Resistance takes the ship deep into the Atlantic Ocean, right to the entrance of the vault. Here, Set takes BJ inside the Dot Yishud vault underwater, where they find a unique power suit developed by the Society. The armor has built-in Neuralink interfaces which allow for superhuman strength and agility. It essentially turns the wearer into a super soldier. 
BJ takes the suit back to the Resistance and gives it to Caroline, who, with the suit's help, is no longer inhibited by her paralysis, and can, in fact, fight better and more fiercely than she ever did. Oh, and uh, something else they find in the vault? A weapon called the Spindly Torque, which is essentially capable of destroying Super Concrete. And now, back to the big N. No, not Nintendo. The Nukes. The nuclear missiles that their hijacked vessel is equipped with. The Resistance formulates a plan to use these nuclear weapons and fire them at Death's Head's compound, to not only kill the man once and for all, but also to deal a devastating blow to Nazi High Command and help the Resistance get an important and much needed win. But they can't just fire the weapons when they please, of course, because to fire these missiles, they need nuclear codes that they can only get from a specific Nazi base. So all they need to do is infiltrate the base, right? Get the codes and get them back? Easy peasy. Oh, and I think I forgot to mention, this Nazi base, it's on the moon. Here's where that super concrete destroying spindly torque comes in. BJ uses the dot you should tech to intercept a Nazi official, kill him, and steal his identity. Using this, he's able to travel to and infiltrate the lunar Nazi base. After sneaking, at first, and then fighting his way through the base and its defenses, BJ manages to acquire the nuclear codes. When he gets back to Earth, though, he finds that he's coming back to not a very pleasant return. Death's Head, it seems, hasn't been sitting idly by while BJ and the Resistance formulate their plans. He and Irene Engel have mounted an attack on the ship and taken the Resistance members captive, including Anya and Set. BJ, Caroline, with her new power suit, and Fergus or Wyatt, depending on which one's still alive, manage to make it out of the U-boat, though, while the rest of the Resistance members are taken back to Death's Head's personal fortress. As you may have guessed, the aforementioned fortress is where things come to a head in Wolfenstein the New Order's dramatic finale. Making use of the spindly torque once again to get inside of Death's Head's compound, BJ, Caroline, and Fergus or Wyatt fight their way through his forces. BJ also encounters Booby, Engel's second in command, and manages to kill him. The three of them eventually find and successfully evacuate the captured Resistance members, but BJ's mission is only half done yet. He makes his way upward through Death's Head's compound and reaches the very top, where Death's Head himself waits in his laboratory. After their meeting, he reveals to BJ that the one he'd killed 14 years ago, Fergus or Wyatt, went on to become part of one of his experiments. Death's Head preserved his brain and put it in a robot, essentially creating a mech version of him. Buckle in, it's only gonna get more ridiculous from here. So Death's Head unleashes the robot on BJ, who after a firefight manages to defeat it, before finally putting his friend to rest once and for all by destroying his brain. At this point, Death's Head himself enters another giant robot and proceeds to take on BJ in a one-on-one -on -one duel. After an intense fight, BJ defeats Death's Head. He drags him out of the robot's cockpit and is on the verge of executing him when Death's Head reveals a hidden grenade in his hand. The grenade explodes, killing him while also absolutely mauling Blazkowicz, who crawls away with devastating injuries. In the distance, the Resistance members radio BJ and ask him if he's left the fortress so that they can be clear to launch the nuclear missiles. Knowing that his injuries are most likely fatal, BJ closes his eyes and confirms the order, at which point the screen cuts to black, and Wolfenstein The New Order comes to an end. But of course, BJ isn't dead. This is the end of part one of our Wolfenstein story recap, but we'll be returning soon with part two, in which we'll be covering the entire story of Wolfenstein 2, The New Colossus, so stay tuned. And that wraps it up. If you like what we're doing, please consider subscribing to our channel. We upload new videos daily. Also, don't forget to switch on the bell notification icon, that way you don't miss out on any of our videos.